have pieces, right? Sometimes. No, I had you guys go on there, I think. Yeah, when you take it out, there's all kinds of pieces that are there. Oh my goodness, look at all these pieces right here. Like, there are so many uh, that, and each individual piece is important. I don't know who that is right there. Maybe Mary? Mary at the tomb? No, it's a baby. What do you, what do you see here? <laughs> oh, it's a baby. Okay. <laughs> what do you see there? Noah. Noah. Uh, all right. <laughs> Maybe Noah. Somebody's fishing, right? Uh, let's see. What else? We got, oh, look at this. We got some kids here that look like they're closely paying attention, just like you. Isn't that cool? All right. But, uh, all right. We're going to try something, okay? I'm going to give you... Uh, um, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to put this puzzle together, okay? Dude! All right? Hey. On your mark, get set, go! You can't even get up with the <laughs> Oh, right, I don't need Okay. All right, 15 oh, seconds. Alright, we, we got 10 seconds left. Some of the puzzle pieces, didn't you? No. Uh oh, not really? Oh, hey, look. We did get one. That's good. You got the donkey? Here, show them, show them what you were able to. Three or one. You gonna show them? She got the donkey. That's good, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, but they, uh, you know. The, the, don the donkey is not the puzzle, right? It's just part of it. Now, there's, there's a lot of pieces. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, y'all put it all back. Y'all are some good kids. Okay, so, uh, so, so in, in life, all, all, all eyes appear. All eyes appear. So in, in, there's a reason why you're here today. Uh, it's really these two. Jesus loves you is the re one reason. The other is that your mom and dad want to see you guys grow up to be strong women for the Lord. And so uh, there's a bigger picture that's here. Okay. Now, now I, I know what you what you probably did. Hold on just a second, okay? So I know what you probably did when when you got this. You you went. You said. Where, where, where's the picture? Okay, how can I put this together? So, in life, many times we don't have all the pieces right then, but God doesn't overwhelm us with the pieces that He gives us. He gives it to us over time, and, and we see these pieces in Scripture. Like, I give you a future and a hope, and I have a plan, and I have a purpose for you. Uh, or uh, Romans eight twenty eight, God works all things for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And many other verses that talk about having joy and love and unity. These are all a part of your life puzzle, okay? And, 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 and but here's the thing. Like, you were really trying to put it together fast, weren't you? Yeah. I, that was really fun. Y'all were like, y'all were scrambling it on there. But here's the yeah, thing. I was trying to make mine together. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, I'm sure that bridge was coming. Yeah, got a little bit of time. But... <laughs> But uh, when, it, when it comes to the puzzle, can we all just get on the same page and say, it takes time. It takes time. It does. It? it wasn't enough time. So you being the people that God, went, he has a beautiful picture for your life. He has the big picture, and he will construct it in his timing. But guess what? Not only do your, your mom and dad and the people who love you want to see that picture brought about, and God will bring about the beautiful story, but this church wants to help in any way that they can. And so that's why we're here. That's why you're here today. So not only does God love you, but he's constructing the big picture. Amen? Amen. Amen. Awesome. Uh, Holly, or uh, Roger, would you, would you, uh, before Holly takes you into the church, I can make fun of That's awesome. All right. <laughs> Uh, Roger, can you can you uh, uh, pray for for the children before sure. they transition into the? Yes, we'll, let's pray. Thank you, God, that we can 
Though we don't see all the big, all the things in the, that are making us who we are going to become, thank you that you have the big picture. And I pray you'll bless every child here today that uh, as they try to figure out what life is all about, that they'll realize that you love them and you have a plan for their lives. And if they just listen to you, that they'll get to see the big picture someday. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, you're dismissed. Can Woo! They, I'll can they take the puzzle with them? Oh, certainly. Certainly, certainly. Let me get that lid on. There you go. Thank you. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 1. We'll be picking up in verse 12. Last week, we talked about recapturing joy and how without love, we're not able to have joy. For the Spirit is love, semicolon, joy, peace, etc. Right? Uh, so if Jesus is in your soul, you'll have joy. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. All right, good. Y'all were listening last week. That's good. Uh, well, well, really, you probably got that one remembered. Uh, you know, no, no forgetting that one. Uh, but we'll continue through this expositional series in Philippians. It's the power book. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, are you ready? Go say, say, are you ready? For some Holy Spirit power. Some Holy Spirit power. Are you ready? For some Holy Spirit power. All right. This is the power book, Philippians. Uh, as last week, we we talked on joy. This week, we talked about the bigger picture. All right, the bigger picture. Uh, I believe, as I said last, that this has a great deal of usefulness to the believer in the body of Christ, and. We see here in Philippians that Paul was the master of perspective. The sensei, you know, you ever seen a karate kid or whatever he's teaching them? Like Paul could teach us about perspective. If anybody in the Bible had the perspective, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find someone other than Paul. So hopefully we will glean a perspective, a godly, heavenly perspective as Paul had. Because remember, he's in a jury dark cellar, chained up by elite Roman guards. His life is not warm and fuzzy and rose-colored. Uh, yet Paul sees the bigger picture. Paul is going to teach us how to have the right perspective and to see the bigger picture, if you will. Uh, the overview here of Philippians is this, the, the, uh, starting in verse 12. I'm going to break it down this way today. So I'm going to tell you where we're going, and then we're going to go there, okay? Uh, verse 12 is the furtherance of the gospel. That's, he, he, I, I'm going through this difficult time. I'm, I have trials <laughs> is because, my, because the gospel is being furthered. And then verse 13 and 14, uh, it is to further grow the body of Christ. At least that's, that's what uh, the point where we're trying to get across today. And then 15 through 18 is to further grow. For us to further grow our walk with Him. Alright? I'll stand by this statement like I did last week. This book has what uh, I need. But most importantly, it has what we need collectively as a church. As we go verse by verse through this book, we will see how all of these themes are infused together. Love, joy, unity, heavenly perspective, all of those things coming together beautifully. Uh, but better yet, we'll see how these themes are interrelated to us and how we have not independence, but interdependence within this joyous body of believers. If you want to, if you may, please stand upon the reading of God's word in Philippians 1, picking up in verse 12. I'll read it for you. Yeah, if you would, stand. Verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. 
Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my change, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. May the Lord bless the hearers of his word. You may be seated. Today, uh, if you take away anything with you, I hope that it's this, is that you walk away with a bigger picture mindset, uh, uh, the biggest bigger picture mindset that you've ever had and can only be seen with the mind of God. Now, seeing this bigger picture has everything to do with God and has very little to do with us. Perhaps you're tracking with me so far, but you're thinking, well, that sounds good, Seth, but what does that mean exactly? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Here's a running definition for you. If you're taking notes, you want to jot this down. The bigger picture mindset is when regardless of our present circumstance, we choose to see God's perspective and live out our God-ordained purpose as a result. I'll say it again. Bigger picture mindset is when regardless of our present circumstances, there's three P's in there, present circumstances, we choose to see God's perspective and live out our God-ordained purpose as a result. So many times we don't see or have this mindset, even as Christians. But I assure you, he is working it out and accomplishing his purpose in the process. When our situation is less than ideal, it can be difficult to have the bigger picture. But if we persevere, we will gain a perspective like never before. Contrary to popular opinion, life is not point A to point B. Yet he uses, his, uh, he uses adverse circumstances to bring about his purpose. Now this is seen through Bible stories like the story of Joseph. You remember the, the, the coat of many, many colors? Uh, he is given this coat by his father who loves him, cares for him, and, and then uh, God gives him these dreams. And you remember the one about uh, the, the sheaf of wheat bowing down to the one that's in the center? Of course, it was a prophetic vision that he had, a one that would be unveiled later. But, you know, that really didn't bode well for his brothers uh, whenever he shared this vision with them. Like, we're going to bow down to you? What? Baby brother? Pipsqueak, brother, we're going to bow down to you, right? So they don't like it. They put him in a, they put him in a pit, sell him to slavery, do awful to him, really. And then he's shipped off to slavery, he's accused of rape, falsely, put in prison, he's forgot about, and then he's brought back out because they're like, oh yeah, that guy, that guy Joseph, he had dreams. Yeah, that guy Joseph, he had visions, right? And so he comes back uh, to the palace, interprets the king's dream perfectly by the Holy Spirit, amen. And he, when he does that, uh, he is promoted and he's second in command of all. And he ends up saving not only the people of Egypt with the famine that was there in the area, but he ends up saving the people of God, the Israelites. So God had the bigger picture. Uh, and then you, you look at David. Uh, he's the shepherd boy out in the field, right? But he's, he's a man after God's own heart. And... Uh, God says, hey, look, this guy named Saul, you, you know, he's, he's not seeking my ways. He's not being obedient. It's, you know, you're going to be the king. And so that's what David did, right? He just ascended right into the king. Uh, nope. <laughs> Psych. That's not at all what happened, right? Saul chased him down for almost a decade trying to take his life. He was trying to kill him, trying to corner him, trying to, you know, spitefully use him. Hey, like, come over to my house and we'll have dinner together. But, hey, you know, if, uh, if uh, like, halfway in I decide that uh, I would like to have one of my servants execute you, you know, good luck, right? I'm sure David was pretty fast as well as strong. But uh, I, it is through that time, through, that, through those trials that we have some of those precious psalms. That we value today. Realize they were birthed out of the trial. They were birthed out of the difficulty. So I want to postulate before you today that through those trials, God transforms us. Through those trials, God speaks. 
his life and allows us to see the bigger picture. And here's the kicker, if you'll trust him. If you'll trust him, he'll show you the bigger picture, just like the puzzle pieces, right? But it takes time. It takes time. So let me set this scene here in Philippians. Uh, what, what is happening in this, in this passage? Essentially, in verse 12, they, they have sent an inquiry letter, much like we have the, the missionary. Cindy, what's, what's, the, what's the brother's name who we support in India? Uh, he, he came. Brother Roy. Yeah, Brother Roy. Uh, and so Brother, brother Roy, yeah, we, we had the uh, opportunity to have him come forward. And, uh, you know, we prayed around him. And I'm telling you, he's being persecuted. He's been drug out by his feet from villages before. Like, for the sake of the gospel, he's being persecuted. And he, uh, he's got testimony after testimony. Uh, Paul is experiencing very serious things, and they're concerned for him. So this is, a, this is Paul's response to their concern letter. They're, they're wanting to know, what's happening? Are you depressed? Are you downcast? Are you distraught? Uh, we hear you're being persecuted pretty heavily for the gospel, and you're in chains. How's your health, Paul? How's your spirit? Are you okay? Are you making it out all right? Now, uh, they send Aphroditus to go and inquire for him. And Paul, in these next couple verses, is answering, responding to their concerns. Now, what is happening in Acts, it's spoken, it was prophesied that Paul would go through these. In Acts 21.10 and Acts 19, and, uh, Acts 19 saying, it will, oh, you'll go before kings, that uh, you'll, you'll be uh, above those who are the, in charge of the people of the day. And so this is exactly what happened. You would think, you know, Paul shouldn't be too surprised by this. But if you've ever read through Paul's missionary journeys, you'll see that Paul's plans and his dreams often didn't go the way that Paul's plans and dreams, right? He said, I wanted to go to Spain. I wanted to go to Rome. And I honestly can't doubt the man, right? Who, who wouldn't want to go to Spain? But anyway, that, all, that, all that aside, Paul had, you know, things that he wanted to do with his ministry. But God had him right where he wanted him with the palace guard. Uh, now, uh, it, if, if anything's worth noting, it's, it's noting that God is over it all. And so in the next couple verses, Paul sets the record straight. So this is his response, all right? And it would be so easy for Paul to go, this is awful. I don't like my life right now. My chains are chafing every bone in my body. I am unable to even, uh, you know, think straight because of the stench that's in the room. I, I wish that I could just have a normal uh, laid back day, but I'm in this awful place of prison. But he doesn't do that. Or rather, we see uh, that he says in verse 12, uh, actually, things are being turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So he's got this view that God has him there to further the gospel. And that's, that's the first point uh, today, or rather uh, the first of three ways in which God gets us to see the bigger picture. So if you're taking notes, you want to jot down number one. Uh, number one is the furtherance of the gospel. C.S. Lewis said, the glory of God as our only means to glorifying is our only means as to glorifying him the salvation of human souls is the real business of life uh, another way of putting this our lives being changed our lives being changed when the church goes through tough times they will they're able to see the bigger picture of the gospel being further when the church goes through these times, uh, we really get to see the testing of what's there. You know, it's, it's, we're, we're, how's, how's the faith? I'm going to tell you, the testing of the Christian is not when times are going easy or smooth. It's when, you know, they're difficult. When, when you know, that's when our faith is testing. May I share with you this morning that God is more concerned with our spiritual growth and how it will edify the body and glorify God than he is with our own personal comfort. Uh, there's, this, there's this story about a man. He worked with the uh, Salvation Army in Boston for many years. And he passed by the saloon. And it was always ruckus. It was always jamming. And it was kind of a place he didn't want to be at night. But he was just passing through the Salvation Army. As many times the Salvation Armies were like right in the middle of those uh, dicey places. And as he's walking by, 
So he's walking by, a brick hits him right in the side of the head. And uh, he's in intensive care unit for 18 months. I know, you're just walking down the side of the, side of the road one day, the next minute, you know, you got a brick upside your head and you're, you're laid up in the hospital. Uh, and what you were doing was serving God. You were the Salvation Army. And then the next thing you know, here you are uh, holding on to life. But he said in his memoir uh, that he was thankful for this time because in this time he wrote this book called Helps to Holiness. And thousands of copies were distributed uh, and many, many of lives were impacted as a result. And uh, so he said later, if there had been no little brick, there had been no little book. Uh, his wife saved the brick that hit him in the head and uh, engraved on it this verse, Genesis 50, 20. Uh, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Christ has lens of purpose which allow us to see a much broader spectrum. You know, Paul didn't wake up going, Woo! I'm in prison. This is a great day, you know? He didn't do that. Uh, but take this on for size. Back then, the Rome was the culture of, uh, it was the center of economic growth, of culture, and of the, of the day, it was the political epicenter. And so, is it any happenstance that Paul is there ministering to the most loyal soldiers. These soldiers, they're the Praetorian guards. They're paid double what everybody else is. They are uh, about a thousand selected soldiers, uh, just depending on the time period. There was sometimes more, there was sometimes less. But these were chosen because they were the, the most loyal. And back then, a lot of times, if your term went short, it was probably because you were assassinated. So uh, these soldiers were handpicked. Like, this is your inner circle. You want to make sure you get some people who got your back because if you don't, and the, the way the times were then, I mean, you could be in one day and you could be, you could be out the next. And so Paul is here in this, this prison. He is, he is praising God. Uh, God, not only is he praising, but he's witnessing. And I can just imagine, these centurion guards, uh, according to tradition, what they would do is they would chain themselves to these high-profile prisoners. Paul's a high-profile prisoner for six hours at a time. I'm not going to lie to you. I would kind of probably like to be uh, a chain to Paul. That would be kind of cool. I mean, you might would say that's a weird place, Seth, to insert yourself in the Bible. If you could be anywhere in Scripture... Chain me up to Paul. I mean, he would tell you some stuff, wouldn't he? Uh, and so, guess what's happening? You know, that he's like, I bet he's doing like he did uh, in Acts, where he was praising God at midnight. And they're like, why are you singing praises, Paul? What's wrong with you? What's the matter with you? Don't you see where you're at? You're in the dungeon. And he's like, I'm singing about Jesus. Who's Jesus? Who's Jesus? And off we go, right? And there he is for the next six hours telling them about Jesus and, and, and what he's done for them and how he loves them and how he's got a plan, how he's got a purpose. And so we see in verse 13 that it says, the palace guard knew. All right, so ask yourself, how does the palace guard know? How do they know? Well, they have to know something about Christ in order to know that Paul's chains are in Christ. Are you all with me? Uh, so there, here we have this elite group of Roman warriors. I mean, these are the best of the best. They live a life in the lap of luxury, but they have Paul here who is transforming the inside of their prison. And it doesn't say some. It says all the palace guard know. I'm just going to go ahead and hash it up and say revival is breaking out in prison. And not only is this significant that it's in the prison, but it's significant because... These people are the most influential people, arguably, in all the world. They are, like, next to the emperor. And if you fast forward a little bit, this is what happens. One of these imperial guards, I thought this was so cool when I found out. One of these imperial guards, they come to the Lord, and then they have a daughter named Helena. Helena has a baby boy named Constantine. 
Of course, Constantine uh, turns the world upside down when he comes to rule uh, a couple generations later and says, you know, Christianity will no longer be persecuted and it becomes, by and large, the religion of the world because Rome owned everything, basically. And so it's incredible. But if you go back to the seed, right, here it is, Paul, witnessing to the palace guard. If that's not awesome, I don't know what it is. So that's the first one, the furtherance of the gospel. The second way, and God gets us to see the bigger picture, is the furtherance of the body of Christ. In verse 14, we see that Paul says, they are more bold to speak the gospel. Not only the lost, speaking the gospel to the lost, but the believers, the small pocket of believers are there. They're saying, look, if Paul can be in jail and he can be persecuted and imprisoned, like, you just couldn't shut Paul up. Paul is in the jail, and here he is still doing his business. Why? Because he's got the bigger picture. You can't smolder that. You can't stop that out. You can't prevent that from happening. But there's a charge that happens. Not only are the imperial guards coming to the Lord, but the believers that are there, they're catching wind of it. They're saying, you don't believe what's happening. He's reaching the imperial guards. It's crazy. You know, and that, that really just must set the uh, emperor on fire, right? He's trying to contain Paul, and then really he's got a wildfire on his hands. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but here's what's happening. They, as he's sharing the gospel, uh, those believers who are there, small pockets, scared out of their mind, probably wouldn't want to share with anybody else. They're saying, if Paul can do this in prison, I can go across the road and share with my neighbor. I, I can tell the people that I work with that, have you heard about Jesus? You know, I can tell that individual that I know who's really sick and doesn't have much time left that there is a God who loves them and has a bigger picture for them. But I want you to know that God not only has a bigger picture individually, but he has a bigger picture for our church. Track with me. What does that bigger picture mindset look like for our church? It looks like unity, letting down our arms, coming together because of the high bar of love God has called us to and joyfully getting to serve one another. We get to serve one another. We don't have to. We get to. And that's the overflow of that high bar love. Now, I want to tell you this. We don't have enough weapons. We don't have enough artillery and ammunition to fight one another. We have to direct all our efforts towards strengthening one another and widening what I'll call the circle of safety. And uh, this circle of safety thing uh, comes from Aesop. He's a, from the 6th century. So, uh, six hundred years before uh, Jesus shows up on the scene, roughly. Uh, and this is what he shared, you know, in regards to this. He said, a lion, you have to picture this, a lion used to prowl about a field in which four oxen used to dwell. Many a time he tried to attack them, but whenever he came near, they turned their tails to one another, so that whichever way you approached them, he was met by the horns of one of them. At last, however, they fell quarreling among themselves, and each one off to the pasture alone in a separate corner of the field. Then the lion attacked one by one and soon, and soon made it into an end of all four. If we widen the circle of safety and direct our efforts at strengthening one another to push forward the kingdom, the gifts of the body will be utilized, edified, and best of all, God will receive all the glory of what happens in this house. Amen? So we're better together. I mean, I, was, I mean, everybody has seen a snippet, right, of the African pride lands where you got the, you know, you got the antelope or the gazelle, in this case oxen, and they're running for their lives, right? Well, they've, they've got something that they can use, right? They can, they can go back to back, and they can use their horns, right? And I saw that. I was flipping through the channels, believe it or not, the other week ago. And I saw, and then when I came across this, I was like, I got to share it, right? But they were strengthened as they came together. They're not able uh, remember, the devil walks around like a war roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Right? They're not able to stand up against the devil unless they join together. But man, if they join together and they get this thing called the Holy Spirit, I asked you this morning, I said, are you ready for some Holy Spirit power? Uh, when we get together and we allow the Spirit to lead us and guide us, look out. You know, When we do that, the body will be edified. 
and God will be glorified. Amen. Amen. So the bigger picture perspective of our church is full of hope, of faith, and love. Uh, the smaller picture is full of emotional anxiety, uh, fake shoestring type of love, and a pessimistic, pessimistic outlook, <laughs> despite overwhelmingly good that is present. I really believe that. If you want to see the good, you'll find it. If you want to see the negative, you'll find that too. But uh, when everything falls, we are better together. Now, this is the third uh, way in which God allows us to see the bigger picture. And this is furtherance of our own personal walk with Christ. Uh, let me get an amen from somebody if this statement is true. We learn from other people's response to crisis. That's true. That's true. Uh, <laughs> There's this misconception about there today. There's this misconception out there today. If we have a great marriage and health is good, there's never a bad day, our kids all turn out right, and people will say, wow, what a Christian. Uh, I, I want to be just like them. Uh, no, no. Uh, they watch you. Uh, they watch you when your kid goes off the deep end. And how you love them and don't condone them, what they're doing. Uh, they watch you whenever you have a real health bout. And you're, you're on the second or third trip to the hospital. And your world's being shaken. They're saying, how's he going to come out of that surgery? They want to know if you're going to look like the world or, or if you're going to look at the negative or if you're going to look at the bigger picture of purpose. God's ultimate purpose is that we be more like Christ. Adversity is not a question it's what we do when it happens. Will we suspend our fleshly negative reaction or let our own selfish desires override the spiritual? Will we give caution to the wind or will we yield to God? Zooming in only allows stress to overwhelm. Zooming out forces us to trust God for what is better. The choice is ours. We can have the bigger picture of purpose and give way to things that are more convenient or more comfortable. But I choose faith. Amen. I choose the bigger picture of faith because it is better. Uh, I like how J. Sidlow Baxter put it. The difference between an obstacle and an opportunity is our attitude. Every opportunity has a difficulty, and every difficulty has an opportunity. If you're, you're taking notes and you want to get that down, again, the, the difference between an obstacle and an opportunity is our attitude. Every opportunity has a difficulty, and every difficulty has an opportunity. So spiritual growth is happening in the body through the chains. They are able to see the bigger picture. But not only is it having a collective growth, but it has a growth individually. Paul sees the bigger picture, even though they are preaching from false motives, as it says in, in 15 from 18, uh, still the gospel is being preached. Uh, to be clear, we preach the full gospel here. Amen. Uh, and, you know, this is not popular today, but in that gospel includes hell. Even though love does also exist in God, we, uh, I'm, it'll be not giving you the full picture. If we're talking about the bigger picture, it would not be providing you the bigger picture to zoom in on one aspect of God without the other. And realize, just realize this. If we try to describe God's love, we just fall so short. We can. Amen. God's love is so great. There's no terms that, that we can truly describe his love. But I want you to know this. God is a fair God. He is a just God. He is a, he is a zealous God. He does not tolerate our sin at the same time that we say we love God. Realize that the fear of God and having a superficial love for God, they don't go hand in hand. And that's a hard truth. You know why? Because instead of latching on to the love, we have to go, oh, my sin separates me from God. Oh, I don't have the posture before God like I should. God, forgive me. It brings you to your knees and you say, humble me, God. Uh, I have a greater view of you. I, I, I believe this. Uh, if we have uh, smaller uh, opinions about ourselves and we have higher opinions of others, we also have a higher opinion of God. Uh, we have a better threshold to serve Him with as well. And there's a direct correlation to that. So know that the God that we serve, oh man, He's a God of power and, and yet He's a God of tenderness. Uh, he's a God of justice, yet He's a God of mercy. 
Uh, and so we see these juxtapositions that are there. And uh, when that is the case, let me just tell you, it's better to fall on the grace. Amen. Just go to God. Just go to Him. Don't, don't try to strong arm it. Don't try to, you know, uh, you know, do three circles and about face and, you know, sneeze at, the, at 12 o'clock just at the right time. It just it doesn't, doesn't work that way. Go to God with your, your habits, hang-ups, and worries and give it to Him and allow Him to move in and through them. But along those notes, you know, the full picture of who God is, uh, we have false teachers that are spoken about here. Um, we have false teachers in our society today. Is that even a surprise? You know, like, uh, there are some who are teaching from, I would say, not, all, not only a false motive, but they not even teaching the gospel. Paul says this, and this was to be differentiated from the Judaizers. I said in chapter 1, it seemed like he... Uh, earlier, it seemed like he, you know, he references in, in Galatians, Ephesians, he talks about the, the, the dichotomy, the difficulty between the, the church uh, that includes the Gentiles and then the, the Judaizers or those Jews who, who said, no, you know, it's in the tradition, like you've got to uphold works and grace. Okay? It's only grace, and God's gospel is for all. So there was some, some contention there, but I believe in this passage. In verse 15, and it's not talking about the Judaizers. Because Paul talks about the gospel of Christ being furthered. Okay? And so, this is essentially what Paul says in response. All right? Uh, and, and just because they didn't have, like, fan mail back then, don't think Paul didn't get some hate mail. All right? I'm sure he's, like, praising God one day. He's witnessing to the Praetorian Guard. And, like, sir, letter. You know, he reads it. You know, oh, here's another one, right? Uh, they're, they're trying, they're trying to, to beat him over the head. They're trying to, uh, you know, uh, get Paul to cash in on the fact that he's in there. They probably said stuff like, uh, well, if, if Paul was really a man of God, he wouldn't be in chains. He wouldn't be in prison. Oh, if Paul was really a man of God, then uh, he, he wouldn't be in the difficult circumstance that he is, right? But those people aren't God, all right? <laughs> They don't know the bigger picture that's taking place. But instead of zooming in on their misperceived motives uh, and their direct intention for false motives, it's not only that they're trying to teach the gospel and like something else comes out, the, the burden of proof seems to be rather that you know, these, these guys are, you know, they're, they know what they're doing. They're being direct and they are intentionally, uh, why? Why would they diminish Paul and his work and what they're doing? They want, they want the credit. They want the, they want the uh, attention. Uh, you know, they can't celebrate the good that's happening here in Paul. Uh, I think that's, that says a lot of an individual when we can praise the God that's in someone else. Uh, and, and if you have a relationship with uh, God, then you have something that's worth praising about. I don't think we do that enough. I don't think we, we call it out enough in others and say, I'm so thankful for you, sister. Thank you for the way you serve others. Thank you for how you do so much and you don't you ask for so little. And, you know, you're just a saint. I'm so thankful to be able to work with someone like you. You know, many times we don't do uh, that. But uh, Paul is able to see the bigger picture. He's saying, <laughs> he's saying, well, praise God. And actually, in, in 18, he says, he says, what then? Uh, what then? I think you could, I think you could interpret that like this. So what? <laughs> Who cares? Um, or, or better yet, I like it like this. Watch, watch this. He's like, oh yeah, watch this. Watch this. The gospel is being furthered. People are coming to him. Lives are being changed. And God is using him uh, in ways as only he can. So some may have ran down Paul's name, but he was... He was so full of the Spirit. He was so focused on God that he didn't allow it to change his course and what he was doing. Paul had an appointed, he was, a, a, he was anointed and appointed, as I'll, I'll say, which means he had a special assignment in defense of a strategic position. Uh, you know, you hear the term apologetics. It comes from the Greek word apologia, which, is, which means to defend one's faith. 
And so, man, if, if there was ever a time where Paul's having to defend his faith, you know, we, we think he's just telling them about Jesus and they're getting saved like that. But just know that they had cultures, they had traditions, they had layers, they had uh, long duration of pain that they went through. And so these, these people, they're multifaceted. And yes, the demonstration of the Spirit is powerful and it's breaking down those walls, but there were some barriers that were there. I'm thinking many times it took the full six hours before they came, or it took several shifts you know, of them being with Paul before they came. And so something that we have to remember is that it takes time. It's a process. But God, through that process, allows us to see the perspective. And in that perspective of the bigger picture, we are able to see the purpose of what God's doing. And God uses the things that we go through to bring about his mission, his plan, his purpose, uh, unlike any other way than when we are going through a time uh, that is, is difficult, a time that is testing. Because it's there where we see the fruit of the Spirit, the faith that is there, that indwells the individual. Paul is it's, it's unmistakable. You can't miss it here. Paul has this attitude that God is working. It's evident on all that come in contact with him. Even though Paul would say later on in the New Testament that I'm the chief of sinners. There's no mistake about it that uh, God used this man powerfully to reach people with the gospel. And, and, you know, when we read this, we know that it's inspired by God's word. Like God used Paul to write this. And, and you know, I'm sure Paul had those days, right? I'm sure he had those days where he went, all right, well, here we go again, and you know, same, same. I'm in, I'm in the, I'm in the prison, and, and so. But it was, it, it wasn't his, it wasn't his circumstance or his experience uh, that led to his perspective. It was his attitude with his circumstances that led to his perspective. Are you with me there? So when we have the circumstances, know that that's not, that's not the end of it. Matter of fact. You probably just on one of the pet puzzle pieces that's there. If I had that puzzle here, I'd point it up and I'd show you that, you know, it's just one puzzle piece. And God's got the bigger picture. It's a beautiful picture. Amen. And it's brought about as we seek to together um, work alongside one another so that God can bring about that big picture that he wants to be seen in our life. And in closing, I'll say this. The foundation of the bigger picture is nothing less, nothing more than the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is the foundation of the biggest picture. And this book is an incredible book because we see from Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. And even, even in, in this day, even in this age, God is still writing his his story. He's not surprised at what's taking place. And it's, it's up to us to trust in God, to allow God to work in and through us as we partner together to see that big picture brought about. And that only happens when we suspend, better yet, not suspend, but when we rid our doubts, our worries, our anxiety, all those things. And we, we trust the God who's, who, who's painting the canvas, right? Uh, he, he's, he's taken uh, the raw material that he has, and he's working it. He's working it for his good. And this we can trust, that he who has begun a good work will bring it into completion, and that God will be glorified. But I want to tell you that all of these things I shared today, the furtherance of the gospel, you know, the first one being how we see the bigger picture, the second one being the furtherance of the body of the Christ, and the third one being the furtherance of our own personal walk, none of those happen without a relationship to God. So if you're here today and you need to, A, have a relationship with God, or B, get right with God, then as Gabe comes forward and leads us in a word uh, of song, that I'm going to ask today that, that you would, excuse me, a layman, a layman comes forward. Uh, I'm going to ask you that today would, would be that day. Life is too short. Here's one thing we know about Paul. Paul never knew. Paul never knew when his last breath would be. 
Paul never knew when his last moment would be here on earth, and so he had to be ready. Not only should we be ready to share the gospel, and we should seek the furtherance in all things, uh, but we shouldn't be caught not having a big picture mindset. So that's, that's, my, that's my heart for you, and I believe that in this bigger mind, mindset, we, we have a heart for the things of God. Uh, we get vulnerable, transparent with one another. Like I said, we think less of ourselves, lower opinion of us, higher opinion of God. But more importantly, maybe the more, most important thing in the bigger picture, and hear this, last thing I want to say, is that we see the work in progress together. And as we join together, God brings about the bigger picture for his glory. Amen? Amen. 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 She said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I think that's a, that's a good thing to do. That's the song we we're going to sing. If you would, uh, rise. And we'll, we'll sing that song together. <clears throat>